other talk about uh, advances that we've made in the past uh, decade in uh, finding genes for intelligence. And usually when I talk about intelligence, I start with this picture, because this is basically the, the basis of, of what I'm interested in. So here we see uh, a normal distribution, yeah? a normal distribution of IQ, if, uh, and the, of course the assumption is that IQ test scores are a good proxy of intelligence. Um, but of course we can debate about what intelligence is, but here we assume that the IQ test uh, does a very good uh, uh, way. So these are all our IQ test scores, and some people will score very low on this test, and some people will score very high, but most people will be somewhere around here. So what I'm mainly interested in is finding the causes of why some people are over here and some people are over here. I would like to understand the reasons for this. And of course for any trait which has a distribution like this, there are basically two main factors that can introduce differences between individuals. So one is the environmental differences and the other one is the differences in genetic makeup. And both of them can be uh, of importance for explaining differences between individuals. Now, twin studies are one way of looking at uh, the relative uh, uh, contributions of genes and environment to many different traits. So we recently conducted a, uh, a meta-analysis of virtually every twin study that was published in the last century. And of course, one of the most heavily investigated traits uh, in the twin literature is IQ, is intelligence. So uh, this is from uh, the website that was published together with this paper where we meta-analyzed all the twin papers that published something on uh, IQ tests. So we found more than 150,000 uh, monocyclic twin pairs and more than 150,000 dicyclic twin pairs that contributed to the twin correlation estimate, which you see over here. So these are the MC and the DC twins, and then we can also distinguish between uh, monocyclic males and females and dicyclic twins of same sex or males, females, or opposite sex, but let's just focus on this one and that one. And here you see that the monosyclic twin correlation is 0.71 and the disyclic twin correlation is 0.44. So this is when we take everything together, so across all countries, all different age groups, uh, every study that has been conducted uh, in the last century, then these are the estimates that we get. If you translate this to uh, the relative influence of genes and environment, then the estimates are like this. So 50% is due to heritability. So the, the, the variance that you just saw in that uh, normal uh, distribution, 50% of that variance can be explained by the differences between people in, in the genes. The other 50% is due to the environment, so it's 50-50. However, the environment can be split up in shared environment and non-shared environment, and we could also find that 24% uh, of the variance is due to differences between people in the shared environment, and the remaining is due to differences in the non-shared environment. Yeah, so for this trait, in general, across all different age groups, across all different countries, the heritability is around 50%. Of course, you can also look across different ages, and then this is what we see. So when we uh, do the same as we saw in the previous slide, we use twin studies to determine the relative contribution of genes and environment, then the heritability of IQ seems to be much lower in childhood, and it increases as we age. And so uh, when we're about 60 or, or 80 years, and the heritability is extremely high, it's about 85%. But uh, at, uh, in childhood, heritability is around 30 or 40 percent, with a very large contribution of the shared environment. But this time, it is the reasons for this pattern are still uh, unknown. But it's very likely that this is due to gene environment correlation. For example, that people seek out their own environments once they uh, grow older, and then the environment, the G by E correlation, will become part of the estimate of the heritability. And so that's one way, one reason that we could think of uh, explaining this pattern. Okay, so once you know that a trait is heritable, you would like to know what are the genes. So a decade ago, we couldn't really do this in a very nice manner. It was very costly to search for genes. So the only good method that we had in hand that was feasible for us was to do a linkage analysis. So a linkage analysis, you compare genetic similarities between members of the same family and you link that similarity in the genes to similarity in the traits. And what it will give you in the end is a region on a chromosome 
that is very likely to harbor genes that are important for your trait. It doesn't give you the actual genes, but it will give you, it will zoom in a little bit on which chromosomes are of importance. So we conducted the first genome-wide linkage scan for IQ in 2005, and uh, this is what we found. We found evidence for significant linkage on chromosome 2 for performance IQ, and there was also almost significant linkage here. It was just on the threshold of being significant on chromosome 6. And then uh, we also found a little peak, over, little peak over here. But this study uh, was done in different phases. Uh, in, in each different phase, we collected more data. And in one of the phases, when we conducted uh, the, the genome-wide linkage study, the chromosome 7 was actually our highest peak. When we finally published the study, uh, we had more data and this peak uh, went down. But when we first found this uh, significant peak, we immediately started looking under this linkage peak to see what kind of genes uh, were there. And uh, so this is the chromosome 7 again with uh, a high uh, peak, which means there's evidence for, for linkage uh, in this area. And there are uh, about a hundred of genes in this area, but one gene popped out when we started to look under this peak, and that's the CSRM2 gene. Now the CSRM2 gene has been uh, associated with uh, cognition of parents previously in a very small, obscure study that was published before we found these results. And it has also been implicated with uh, alcohol-related cognitive changes. And uh, at that time, there was something known about the function of the gene already, and it's supposed to be involved in synaptic plasticity. So of all the genes that we found to be uh, included in this linkage peak, this gene popped out a little bit, so we decided to genotype this gene, variants in this gene, in the samples that we had in our lab. And um, so we genotyped several different genetic variants, which all were lying within this gene. And then we found that one of the SNPs, uh, which was an AT polymorphism, was associated with IQ. And this is uh, what we found. So people that had uh, two big A's over here uh, had a lower IQ than people that had a double T on this position in the genome. And this was a significant association, so we published this. And of course, uh, this was almost 10 years ago. Now we would say, well, you know, this is only 300 people, so how could you believe this uh, result? Uh, at that time, this was one of the largest studies that looked at the Canada team. So I think time uh, goes very fast in this field. Um, so we published this uh, without having a replication ourselves. But then another group in the US uh, decided to uh, attempt to replicate these results. They genotyped the same SNPs, uh, they also measured IQ, and they found a significant association with the same SNP. So this was then replicated, and a couple of years later it was uh, also um, attempted to replicate, uh, I think, uh, actually from the group of Ian Deary, and they dereplicated it. So this gene has been replicated and dereplicated ever since, we're still debating whether this gene is actually involved in IQ or not. But it was one of the first genes that uh, showed a significant association uh, with IQ. So in 2006, this is the, the general picture. So the red areas on the, on the genome are the areas where we found significant linkage, and then uh, the, the orange areas are also areas where other people uh, found suggested linkage. And then uh, the gene names in blue are genes that have been associated at least once with IQ, but uh, none of them have been replicated. So the CSRM2 gene has been replicated once, but has also been dereplicated. And all of the other genes have sometimes been replicated, or nobody tried to replicate them. So uh, at that time, we didn't really have a lot of knowledge about genes for IQ. Everybody was still thinking, well, this should be the gene for IQ, and if we know that gene, then we can change it, and then everybody will have a very high IQ. But of course, that's never going to, going to happen, because there's not one gene that's going to be associated with IQ. I think we knew that in 2006, we could already conclude that that was uh, not realistic. So this was the current state of the art in 2006, and then a couple of years later, this paper was uh, published, uh, where the authors looked at all the uh, genetic associations from Canada genes with IQ, and they basically concluded, concluded that most of the reported associations are probably false. 
and I tend to agree with that. I think that most of the studies that we, that we published, including my own study, we were very lucky to find something that was significant, but it was probably due to the winner's curse, which occurs if you have a relatively small sample, there might be a large effect in your sample, but it only becomes significant when it happens to be very large, but the real effect is probably much smaller, or maybe it's not even existing. So, um, the good thing is that we learned that we need larger samples, I think. I think that's what we learned from this experience. So, what did we know in 2006, 10 years ago? Well, we knew that intelligence is a highly veritable trait. We know that from twin studies, but also from adoption studies. Uh, we had some indication of where the genes might be, maybe chromosome 2 and 6, but there were also other chromosomes that popped up, so we already knew that it would not be one gene that was important for IQ. And we also had some idea of genes, but we were a little bit disappointed because they weren't replicated. So we were kind of stuck until this new technology in, in the genetic lab was developed, which allowed us to genotype uh, very efficiently a lot of individuals for a lot of SNPs, a lot of genetic variants. So this basically allowed us to genotype thousands of individuals for millions of genetic variants, all at the same time and all at a relatively low cost. So from this time on, when this technology came out, we were able to do a genome-wide association study. So we could look at the whole genome, and then for heritable traits, of course, you, you are almost certain that you're going to find something, right? So you have a heritable trait, you search the whole genome, and then somewhere there must be genetic variants that will explain this high heritability. So the first GWAS for IQ was conducted um, in the lab of Ian Deary, and it consisted of uh, more than 3,000 individuals, which was a relatively large study at the time. And um, their basic conclusion was that uh, IQ was highly heritable and uh, highly polygenic. So they used uh, a lot of uh, adults, unrelated adults. However, they searched for the whole genome, across the whole genome, but they didn't find any significant genetic variant that was associated with IQ. And this was really disappointing, because IQ has a more or less yeah, good heritability, especially in adulthood, where the heritability is around 80%, so it's a highly heritable trait. There was GWAS data, so the whole genome was searched, and then not, not a single SNP popped out of being uh, statistically significant, even though the sample size was more than 3,000 individuals. So this was very disappointing. They did report that their top gene, which was not uh, significantly associated, but their best gene was this gene, the FNBP1L gene. And uh, they also concluded that uh, given that they didn't find at least one significantly associated SNP, and uh, given that we know that intelligence is highly heritable, then the SNPs or the genetic variants that are certainly out there must have such a small effect that we need even larger sample sizes to detect them. So they could conclude from their results that intelligence is a highly polygenic uh, trait with many genes, many genetic variants, with each a small effect influencing uh, this trait. Then the second gene was published on children. And uh, again, there were no genome-wide significant SNPs, even though their sample size was huge. They had more than 12,000 individuals in uh, the discovery sample and 5,000 individuals in the replication sample. So together, this, this was more than 18,000 individuals. There were no genome-wide significant SNPs again. So again, this was disappointing, but remember that childhood IQ is not as highly heritable as adult IQ. So uh, we can imagine that maybe we need larger sample sizes for uh, detecting genes uh, for uh, childhood IQ than we need for adult IQ. However, what was very notable was that the top gene was the FMBP1L gene, which in this sample was actually significantly associated with IQ. So this is the same gene as was found previously in the adult uh, uh, study. So that's, that, 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 that was a very promising result, and it was actually the first gene that uh, everybody had a little bit more confidence in. This was the first gene that we could more or less say, well, it's a replicated gene for IQ. And uh, a little bit more on this study. So uh, in this study, they didn't only look at the single SNPs, they also clumped together the effects of all the SNPs. So that's what we call the chip heritability. So it's the heritability that's due to all the genetic variants that, that's in 
all the measured genes. So you get only one estimate, and you can never break that down to which SNPs are uh, responsible for that estimate, but it gives you the heritability due to the measured genotypes. And they did this in three different samples, and if you compare that to childhood heritability, which is about 30 to 40, maybe 50 percent, then uh, this uh, estimate over here of 46 percent is almost as high as the heritability based on twin studies. So that means that uh, the heritability or the genetic variants that we capture with common variants that, that we measure in a GWAS study can explain nearly all of the heritability of uh, childhood IQ. In this sample, that was not the case in this sample, but in this sample it was very high. Yeah, of course, we cannot say that for the individual SNPs, because they were not even significantly associated. If you would find them with a large enough sample, their effects will be much uh, lower than uh, 46%. And uh, this is an observation that we see in many GWAS studies. So for many complex value GWAS studies have been carried out. And one of the general conclusions that we can draw from all of these studies is that uh, even though we look at very high inheritable traits, like high, for example, with inheritability of 80%, and even though we do find associated SNPs together, these SNPs uh, explain less than 2% of the variance in height. And that's a bit, it, it's not only disappointing, but it's also frustrating. So we have these high inheritable traits, and then you, you, you have a huge sample with millions of SNPs, and you search, you use a cluster computer to run your analysis, and then you only end up with 2% of the variance that can be explained. So, I mean, it's, it's called uh, the case of the missing heritability in, uh, in nature, in an opinion paper. And um, it's, it, some people call it a big problem, but you can also see it as a challenge. And I think we should be able to explain some of it. So possible reasons for not being able to find significant uh, SNPs for IQ is, for example, common versus rare variants. So when we do a GWAS study, we only test for the association of common genetic variants. The common variants are variants that have a, a, a relatively high frequency in the population, and um, those are the variants that we include in our GWAS study. Of course, there can be very rare variants of uh, genetic factors that might have a huge effect on IQ, but in GWAS studies, we typically do not include them, simply because they're not measured or because they have no power um, to start with. Also, um, if we look at the SNP-based heritability, this was nearly as high as the twin-based heritability. The SNP-based heritability was based on all the measured genes in, um, in the GWAS study. So that's only the common variant. So that doesn't really leave a lot of room for uh, rare variants to be associated with IQ. Maybe it's the case that there are non-additive genetic effects uh, important for IQ. And when we do our GWAS study, we have one million variants, and we, t we test each and every variant by itself. So we do one million uh, univariate tests, and we don't take into account that maybe two or three SNPs might interact with each other. So maybe we're not providing our analysis in the correct way. However, we would be able to see evidence of non-additive effects in twin correlations. Because if that's the case, then the MC twin correlation would be much higher and twice the DC correlation. And we didn't really see evidence for that. It could still be an explanation, but uh, the simplest explanation is that non-additive genetic variance probably doesn't really play a very large role in intelligence. Another explanation could be that uh, it's simply millions, or maybe not millions, not maybe ten thousands of genetic variants that are important for uh, IQ. And then each of them has such a small effect that we're just simply not able to detect them. And if, but these uh, large sample sizes of nearly 20,000 individuals. And I think most people think that that's the main, uh, that that's probably one of the main reasons why until now we haven't been able to detect any of these genes. So we need larger sample sizes. So Peter Fisher conducted a, a power analysis um, and he showed that uh, if the effect size is less than 0.5%, so that's a very small effect size, it's not 20% or 10% like we saw in, in the previous talk. 10% is uh, the, the variance explained by the teacher, and let's not talk about it because it's such a small amount of variance that's explained, so let's focus on something else. If we look at genetic studies, then we're talking about effect sizes in the order of 0.5 or even lower percent of the variance explained. 
Yeah, so we know that uh, effect sizes for IQ uh, due to genes will not be higher than this, otherwise we would have detected those genes already. So effect sizes are probably somewhere in the order of 0.2 or 0.3 percent of the variance. If you have a sample size of 5,000 individuals, we don't have sufficient power to detect uh, SNPs with such a small effect size. We need sample sizes in the order of 40,000 and probably even more than that to detect genetic variants um, that are important for IQ. So these are huge sample sizes. So that means that uh, you would have to invest uh, maybe 10, 15 years of your career collecting data, asking people to come to the lab, invest a lot of uh, dollars and euros, testing them with an IQ test, and then maybe if you're lucky, you're able to find one or two SNPs associated with IQ that explain maybe 0.1% of the variance. Well, luckily, we don't have to invest at that time anymore because um, the UK Biobank study is a really a tremendous resource of uh, genetic data and has been made publicly available. Uh, I think it's been uh, by the UK uh, government and it's available for everybody in the field for uh, a very relatively low amount of money that you uh, pay to access this uh, great resource. It includes about 500,000 individuals with data on uh, cognitive testing, MRI, brain scans uh, for a uh, subsample of these people, uh, genetic data, uh, medical information, and um, the group of uh, Stuart actually, it was co authored on this paper, uh, they, uh, they gave access to the, to the first release of the data in UK Biobank, and they had a sample of more than 100,000 individuals. So this is huge, uh, it's really a large set, you cannot even open the files and visually inspect what's in the files. It really requires a lot of computing power and uh, uh, a lot of uh, yeah, command line comments to, uh, yeah, to deal with this kind of uh, data files. So they recently published the gene-wide association study of cognitive functions using the UK Biobank data. And they looked at uh, four different traits available in UK Biobank, group on the numerical reasoning uh, in a uh, sample of 36,000, memory in the full 112,000 individual sample, reaction time, and education of them. For verbal numerical reasoning, uh, they found 149 SNPs significantly associated with, uh, with uh, this trait in three independent genomic regions. For memory, there were no significant SNPs. And uh, when I read this paper, I was really disappointed because memory uh, was the largest sample with more than 100,000. And memory is, is a very uh, well known aspect of cognitive function. So I expected to find uh, more SNPs here, but there were no significant SNPs at all. And if you look at uh, the SNP heritability, so when you plug the effects of all the SNPs together, for memory, this was also very low. And I was just talking to Stuart uh, in, during the break, and he thinks it's probably due to the way memory was measured in the UK Biobank. Because as you can imagine, with such a large sample size, you cannot ask all the individuals to come to the lab and uh, extensively uh, measure them. But they did this online, and the memory test apparently uh, has a lot of error in it. So maybe that's the reason why we didn't, they didn't find anything. Then uh, reaction time yielded a couple of uh, genome-wide significant hits and also educational attainment yielded 15 regions uh, that harbored uh, genetic variants that were associated with differences between individuals in educational attainment. So this is, I think, uh, it, it's really unprecedented progress in the field of cognitive genetics. This is the first time that we have a well-powered study and we're actually finding something. So I think it's very exciting. It's a beautiful study, I think. And these are many examples of, um, it's just a visually graphing uh, what, what they found. So this is a Manhattan plot for uh, educational attainment, where you plot all the chromosomes here and then the evidence association here. And here you see a lot of peaks showing up uh, where indicating that these are significant associations for uh, educational attainment. And then here there's also some evidence for verbal uh, numerical reason. Now, in this study, they also looked uh, at educational attainment. And educational attainment has been uh, of interest in uh, the genetics of cognition for a while already. 
So in 2013, uh, we published a study on uh, GWAS for educational attainment, which at that time was the largest GWAS for 83. And of course, educational attainment is very easily measured because it's just one question. It's just how many years of schooling have you had? And it's, it's not it's different than from educational achievement, but it's just how many years of schooling. So it's a very simple measure. And it correlates about 44 with IQ. In this GWAS, which was a huge GWAS, uh, even now it's, it's a very large GWAS, but at that time it was really huge. We only found three SNPs, together explaining less than one percent of the variance. This was published in science because it was such a large study, but of course not because it was uh, yielded so many so really interesting results, because we didn't really find them. So uh, we recently um, conducted another study for educational payment, which is forthcoming in nature, where the sample size is now almost three times as high. And now finally, we find 74 uh, independent loci in the genome that are associated with um, educational attainment. Together explain, I don't know, what, what would you guess? Would they explain 20% of the variance? Who thinks it's more than 20%? Less than 20%. Yeah, it's less than 1%. Again, in any, in any case, we are finally getting to the genetic variants that are important for proxy of IQ. So we're getting there. And uh, this is a method of uh, this study that is uh, still unpublished, but you should see there's a lot of interesting peaks over here, all pointing towards genetic variants that are important for and uh, this is also an interesting one where we, where we look at the effect size. So here, these are all the independent, so 74 different loci, and then here are a lot of the effect size. So most of the effect sizes are between 0.01 and 0.2% of the variance. Yeah, so it's really tiny effects. And of course, we had the sample size nearly 300,000 individuals. So yeah, these tiny effects can only be detected with such large sample sizes. And uh, this was also replicated in the UK Biobank, where, where 52 of the 74 SNPs uh, were um, also significantly associated with education in the UK Biobank. So it is quite a uh, reliable finding, these SNPs. We also looked at whether these uh, SNPs, uh, whether the genes that were implicated by these uh, significant SNPs, uh, did make sense in terms of uh, their being associated with other traits. And here we see that there's a large overlap, for example, with schizophrenia, but also with autism spectrum disorder and with intellectual disability. So there seems to be a group of genes that pop up uh, as, as, as being associated with many different traits that all have something to do with cognitive uh, function. So the interim conclusion is that there was tremendous progress. I think we're finally uh, getting where we so much, so long won't be from going from uh, wanting to know what is the heritability of IQ, of wanting to know where on the genome are the genes, is this candidate gene associated, and now we finally know uh, which SNPs, which of the genetic variants are associated with IQ. So I think this is unprecedented progress. But of course, the effect sizes are really small. So I think we have to ask, what are we actually doing? So do we want to spend another maybe five or ten years uh, investigating even bigger samples and then finding SNPs that have an even larger and smaller effect size? So if, if we increase our sample size until one or two million individuals, we will maybe find all of the 10,000 SNPs that are associated with IQ. And they will have tiny effect sizes. So what do we, what do we then do? Is that the end point? Is that where we want to go? Is that our main goal, to find these tiny effect sizes? And it doesn't, it doesn't give us any predictive value, and it also doesn't give us any insight into the biological mechanism underlying intelligence. It, it's, it's of no use, actually, these tiny things. So we should do something really uh, smart with these findings in order to be of use to us. We shouldn't just go ahead and increase our sample size and look for the 10,000 genes and then say, yeah, here's my gene explaining 0.01% of the variance in IQ. Be happy with it. No, of course not. So what do we do? We have to make sense of these GMOS findings for IQ. 
And I think one of the questions that we have to ask is, are these thousands of genetic variants, are they randomly distributed across the whole genome? Or do they have something in common? Do they have, for example, in common that all of the genetic variants that are associated with increase in IQ, are they all related to synaptic function, for example? Or are they related to the white matter uh, of the brain? Or are they related to calcium signaling? So we should look for the common denominator across these thousands of genes. And we're no longer interested in these time effects, because these don't really matter. We're interested in the effect of the biological system. We want to know what is the underlying mechanism. That's our end point, I think. That's what we want to understand. And if we understand that, then we can try to, to look further and to, to determine what should we do to change this, or can we change this? It will give us insight into the underlying mechanism of uh, intelligence. So that's one thing I think we should do. The other thing is, this will generate hypothesis. So let's say we have the 10,000 genetic variants. We have concluded that they're all involved in calcium signaling. But that's just an hypothesis. What we have to do next is to validate that hypothesis and show in uh, an animal model, for example, or in a, in a human model, you have to show that if you mess with calcium signaling, that you can change someone's IQ. So that's a functional validation study. And uh, so these two things I will briefly discuss. So one of the things we can do to make sense of uh, these thousands of variants is to do virus copata analysis. And we can uh, look for uh, what is the common denominator of these genes. And then basically there are two issues that are very important in virus copata analysis. So one is the creation of gene sets. So there's a lot of databases that you can query that will give you uh, sets of genes. For example, there's the gene ontology database, or you have uh, the CAF database, and they all give you uh, groups of genes that they say have the same function, for example. Or there are databases that have uh, networks of protein interaction, so the gene products interact with each other, and that's why we think the genes have a similar function. Or there are databases of co-expression. So certain genes are always co-expressed at the same time in the same tissue, so probably they have something to do with each other. Now, what's very important, if you uh, create a gene set, it's very important to know how is this gene set created, why do we think it's a, it's a gene set, why do these genes belong together, and how do we annotate these genes? Now, some genes have been investigated very heavily, and it, a lot of information is out there on what these genes are doing. So those genes are quite reliable. If you say the Apple E gene, for example, we know what it's involved in, we know uh, quite a lot about its function. But there are other genes that have not been investigated very heavily. Maybe there's been one study, and that one study said, well, this gene is involved in a glial function. And then you would conclude, if you find a hit in that gene, no glial function must be important. But many genes have multiple functions. So, um, I, I have, for example, I've created a gene set of genes that I think are important in synaptic function. I tested it for a certain trait, and then I said, well, you know, it's significantly associated, so synaptic function is important for this trait. But then the biologist came to me and said, yeah, yeah, you say it's synaptic function, but I also investigate these genes, and I'm a glial biologist, and these genes also have a function in, in the oligodendrocytes. So it's not synaptic functioning, it's oligodendrocytic functioning. So depending on how you annotate your gene sets, how you annotate the genes, you will draw different conclusions. And uh, we need a lot of biological work to make sure that our gene annotations are much more reliable than, than they are today. Because there's a lot of bias in the online databases. And uh, you, I don't think we can solve this within a year, but we all have to be careful and critical when we, start, uh, when we do our gene annotation. So another thing that I think is very important, once uh, we assume that we have good, well-defined gene sets, is how to do the gene set analysis. And one of my PhD students recently got a paper accepted, a very, uh, very, um, very much detail look at the statistical properties of gene set analysis. And I will not go into too much detail, but I just want to show you a couple of the things that he looked at. So um, genes can be of very different sizes. Some genes are very large and some genes are very small. If a gene is very large, then there are a lot of genetic variants in there. If you then do a statistical test, you will increase your likelihood of finding uh, a significantly associated hit, simply because there's more, 
uh, chances of finding something significant. If you have a small gene, then your chances are much lower of finding something significant. If you don't correct for the size of the gene, then you can highly overestimate your significant association with the gene. So we compared different software tools. Uh, so for example, Force and Jack, Magma, and these are all tools that you can do, can use software tools to do a pathway analysis. And we saw huge differences if you vary the gene size across the different tools. So here's the type 1 error rate, and Magma is the only one together with Inrich uh, that performed quite well. But other tools, they, uh, yeah, depending on the gene size, they highly overestimate uh, your uh, association being significant. So that's something to keep in mind when you run a gene set analysis. Also, if you uh, vary the number of genes in your gene set, so smaller gene sets can be very informative, but some gene sets tend to have a lot of genes in them. Of course, it shouldn't be the case that the number of genes in your gene set is associated with your chances of finding a significant association with the gene set. If you don't correct for the number of genes, then you will get an overestimation again. And again, we see that, for example, Magenta doesn't uh, correctly correct uh, for this. Uh, Enrich does very well, and uh, Jack and Magma also do very well in this. So um, this is just for you, if you want to do a uh, pathway analysis, then um, you need to be aware of the statistical properties of the, of the software tool that you use. And uh, this might be a paper that you can use as a reference. So let's say you've done a biological pathway analysis. You have generated a hypothesis about a certain biological mechanism that you think is involved in uh, IQ. And uh, you can either decide to publish that or you can go one step further and do some functional validation of that. And of course, if you, once you do the functional validation, then you're actually able to prove that something is causal for uh, IQ. So we really need to do we really need to do functional, functional follow-up analysis. So, so where then we can show how a gene effect leads to differences, to differences between individuals in intelligence. So how so should we do that? Well, the classical functional follow-up involves, for example, making a knockout mouse. So uh, you do a genetic analysis, uh, you find a topic in one gene, it's a very large effect, for example, the FP gene, and um, you can ask two questions. You can ask the question, you know, I don't know uh, what this gene is important for, so I just want to know the function of this gene. Then you can make a knockout mouse. So that's a mouse where you assign the gene, and then you do all sorts of tests to see how the behavior of the mouse changes. And then that tells you something about the function of the gene. It doesn't tell you uh, why the gene is associated with your phenotype. It only tells you something about the gene. So the next thing you then have to do is uh, to associate it with the phenotype. So then uh, you should measure the other phenotypes in that mouse. For example, if your trait is IQ, then you can do a water-based test in the mouse, for example. And your hypothesis would be if the, if the gene is locked out, then the performance of that test would be much worse than if you uh, turn it on. Yeah, so then you can functionally relate your gene to the phenotype. Now, in order to do something like that, you need very large effects. You need a functional variant. And you, and you need to know, know what this variant does. does. So you, you need, need to know, know if this variant is, for example, a stop variant. So it causes the gene not to uh, generate a protein anymore. So that will translate into a normal Or it could be a variant that increases uh, the expression of the gene. And then you would do an overexpression or maybe an underexpression style. And so you would need a functional variant. You can only do one, maybe two genes at a time. If you knock out more than two genes in the mouse at the same time, usually that's lethal, so you don't have any phenotype to measure anymore. And you, can, you cannot do this in uh, units, unless you volunteer for our studies, but I don't think uh, we get to our ethical or movie quality. So you would have to do this in animals and in cells. Of course, in genome studies, especially for IQ, this doesn't apply to our situation. We don't have large effects, we use the double functional variants, we have many genes that are important, and we prefer, we can do it in animals, but we prefer to do it in humans, of course. So, um, yeah, that's, that's a problem. So we cannot really use classical functional follow-up studies, and uh, we cannot just walk to a biological department and tell them, look, I did a very nice genome, it's well-powered, 
I have 74 or 37 nice details. Uh, there you go. So they will not be able to do anything with that. So what can we do? Well, a couple of years ago, the Nobel Prize was awarded to uh, someone who uh, found out how to uh, how to create induced pluripotent stem cells. And she was already talk a little bit about it. So I will uh, briefly explain why this is so important for us and why I think this is. Uh, this, this might be our solution to a uh, function for uh, complex traits, but also for, especially for intelligence. So what we do is we, uh, we select genetically informative patients or controls or individuals. Can also be uh, doesn't have to be genetically informative. Can also be phenotypically informative. For example, uh, individuals of extremely high IQ, of extremely low IQ. We collect skin virus from them, so a little bit of their skin. Can also be a hair, or urine, or blood. Uh, we use the new skin because that's uh, an easy protocol. But it can be if you use children, we usually uh, take the hair. And then, uh, of course, the skin is already a specialized cell. But it didn't start out as a skin cell. When we were still very small, uh, we were just one or two cells, and then those cells were really important. They could still become anything they wanted to be. A cell, if you put it back into the pluripotent state, so you put it back in time, it goes back to that state, and then you can start to differentiate it again to a skin cell, but also to a different cell. So from a skin cell, you put it back into, you reprogram this into an induced pluripotent stem uh, state, and then you differentiate it into uh, glia cells, or neuron cells, or astrocytes, for example. So we, we, diff we can differentiate this into brain cells. And if we then have brain cells from individuals with a high IQ and individuals with a low IQ, we can do all sorts of different cellular assays to test what are the cellular differences. Do we see differences in synaptic transmission, for example? If we have generated a hypothesis about calcium signaling, we can test for differences in calcium signaling. So uh, that gives us a way to functionally validate our generated biological hypothesis derived from the genome science. And what's even uh, more exciting, I think, is that we can not only do this uh, on the 2D wells filled with cells from uh, uh, interesting patients, we can also grow a mini brain. So a 3D structure where you can grow mini brains of uh, your high IQ patients and your low IQ patients. And I think this sounds like magic. I can introduce myself, but Fifi Hyatt is one of my big eyes, and she's set up a stem cell, and she really can do all the magic in her lab. And she's currently making mini brains, not for IQ, uh, but for schizophrenia patients in her drawers. But wouldn't it be fantastic to have this for IQ, high IQ and low IQ people? And then you have the 10 or 20 or 30 high IQ brains, and the low IQ brains, and you can do all sorts of tests with them. Ask them different questions to see how the brain reacts. Or you can put a little EEG cap on them. And it sounds like uh, the far away future, but I think it's much closer than we think it is. So uh, this, I think this is very promising tool. And uh, I know we cannot use classical bias or functional follow for complex traits, especially for traits like IQ. So I think IPC is uh, our solution. Uh, will enable us to, uh, to test our biological hypothesis. And even though it's a very, uh, very new technique, there's a lot of people working on this, and they're all collaborating with different labs around the world, optimizing our protocols, and progress in this field is really going very rapidly. Uh, where half a year ago we were still discussing uh, about all the error that we found, and uh, the irreproducibility of our results, now we have protocols that reliable results and that can be reproduced in different labs also. So this is a very rapidly changing field. So I think the general conclusion is that uh, gene finding for IQ for intelligence has seen really tremendous progress. We've gone from not knowing what the heritability of IQ was, not knowing where any of the genes are, to having huge, unthinkable sample sizes, finally finding something and then realizing that we have to do something smart and that we really need biological information. So we've moved on from being completely in the dark to seeing the end of the tunnel, seeing the light. 
And I think the next steps are to uh, have reliable penetration of these gene findings in the biological context. So I know you're all psychologists, I'm also a psychologist, but I think it would be wise to follow a minor or a major in biology and at least be able to talk to the biologists. Because I think that's uh, one of the most important things if you want to understand online biological mechanisms of intelligence. And then, of course, we need functional validation. Okay, this is my group, and uh, thanks to them, uh, I can tell the story. Thank you.